So I think we'll just get started because we have a lot to cover today. Um, so morning everyone and thank you for joining us for our third session of the FS Academy summer series. And today we will be talking about crypto. So we will discuss what crypto is and we will look at how it's regulated at present and we will be, um, we'll end by looking ahead to the future regulatory landscape. So just a couple of housekeeping rules and um, please keep your cameras off and your microphones muted. And after today's session, do feel free to get in touch with myself or other speakers, Sylvia or Anna, or any of um, the FS Reg team here at Burness Paul. And um, if you do have any follow up comments or questions, then please do let us know. So this session and the others will be recorded and sent round to you all after. So housekeeping out of the way, let's uh, dive into crypto. If we could change the slide. Just, okay. So um, you've no doubt heard of what crypt of crypto assets as a generic term, but what does this term actually encompass? Well, from a legal point of view, there is currently no universal definition of a crypto asset, but there is increasing consensus on the basic elements of the definition in UK and overseas legislation and within global standards. So the definition you see on the slide there is one that I've pulled from um, an FCA consultation paper on crypto assets. And it's proposed that um, the current Financial Services and Markets Act, FISMA, will soon be amended to include this definition. Um, so crypto asset means any cryptographically secured digital representation of value or contractual rights that A, can be transferred, stored, or traded electronically, and B, that uses technology supporting the recording or storage of data. Um, and that all seems very complicated, but essentially, in practical terms, crypto assets are tradable digital assets built on um, blockchain technology. Blockchain is an essential component of crypto assets. It's a digital decentralized ledger and it keeps a record of all transactions that take place across the peer-to-peer -peer network. There are different types of crypto assets, including um, cryptocurrencies, which, which many of you will have heard of. The term crypto asset is erroneously used in a very broad sense, but from a legal and regulatory standpoint, it's important that the different types of crypto assets are distinguished. And the way in which the regulator differentiates between crypto assets is by categorizing them into types of what are called tokens, which are distinguished by their different characteristics. Um, so if we just move on to the next slide, um, the list of commonly used terms for crypto assets is set out on the slide. Um, however, this list is not exhaustive um, and there are plenty more uh, different types of, of tokens. So. Um, First, we have security tokens, which are crypto assets that grant rights of ownership or rights to payment of a specific sum of money or entitlement to future profits. Examples would be where they are used as a share or a debt instrument, and they could be used as a capital raising tool. Exchange tokens are crypto assets that are designed to be used as a means of exchange, i.e. payment, for buying and selling goods without traditional intermediaries. They don't grant the holder any rights associated with uh, specified investments. They're not issued or backed by a central bank or other central body. And these are often what are referred to as cryptocurrencies. There are thousands of cryptocurrencies on the market, um, but the two most prominent examples, which you might have heard of, are Bitcoin and Ethereum. So we also have utility tokens. Um, these are crypto assets that might provide the consumer with digital access to a specific service or product such as digital advertising or digital file storage. They don't provide the rights or features associated with a security token, uh, for example, share or ownership rights, and they don't function as a, and they, they do not function as a means of payments, although they can be traded on a uh, crypto asset trading venues for investment purposes. We've got stable coins. Um, there's no single definition of what a stable coin is, however, what they all have in common is their purpose as tokens that attempt to stabilize their value using a variety of mechanisms. Many stable coins are backed with fiat currencies by pegging their value to that currency. Some are backed with different types of assets, uh, including other crypto assets or assets such as 
specified investments or commodities such as oil or gold. And a recent study found that the value of payment transactions powered by stable coins will exceed um, 147 pounds, 147 billion pounds globally by 2028, which demonstrates the growth that we can expect to see in this market. We have um, e-money tokens, which are tokens that meet the definition of electronic money under the UK's electronic money regulations. And finally, on the slide, we have non-fungible tokens, NFTs, which are digital assets that represent a real world object, such as digital only artwork, music or games. NFTs are not fungible, each one is unique and can't be mutually traded or substituted for another token. So moving on to the next slide. Um, now that some of the definitions are out of the way, um, I'll move on to summarise the current regulatory landscape relevant to crypto asset activities in the UK. So the position at the moment is that the UK doesn't currently have a bespoke regime for crypto assets. Um, however, some types of crypto assets do have characteristics that bring them within the UK's existing regulatory regime, either under the Financial Services and Markets Act, FISMA, the Payment Services Regulations or the Electronic Money Regulations. And the tokens which currently fall within the regulatory perimeter are security tokens and e-money tokens. So security tokens eh, fall within the existing FISMA regulatory, regulatory perimeter set out by the REO, the Regulated Activities Order, as they meet the definition of a specified investment under legislation. This is because these tokens provide rights and obligations similar to specified investments, including those that are financial instruments under MIFID. And firms that carry on specified investments involving security tokens, such as, for example, arranging for investments in security tokens, would need to ensure that they are appropriately authorised under FISMA and are adhering to the FCA's rules in relation to their activities. Tokens having characteristics like a share in a company, a debt security, or a unit in a collective investment scheme will be regulated under the FISMA regime. So we have e-money tokens as well, um, which are tokens that meet the definition of electronic money under the EMRs, the e-money regulations, and um, don't benefit from one of the exclusions under the regs. This would include, for example, fiat balances and various types of online wallets or prepaid cards. And again, firms providing e-money tokens would need to ensure that they are appropriately authorised. And then finally, in some situations, an unregulated token um, might be used to facilitate regulated payments, in which case the provider using the tokens in this way would need to consider whether the services fall within scope of the payment services regulations. However, this wouldn't bring the token itself within uh, the regulatory perimeter. So at present, any token that isn't a security token or an e-money token is an unregulated token. And for crypto assets that are unregulated, what this means is that there's no protection for individual investors who choose to buy them and use them as a means of payment or exchange. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please. Um, separately, there is an anti-money laundering regime for crypto assets, which has been in place since 2020. Under the money laundering regulations, the MLRs, crypto asset exchange providers and custodian wallet providers in the UK need to be registered. So essentially firms that provide exchange services for crypto and intermediaries that act as agent for customers and custodians need to register with the FCA. And registered firms must comply with the various AML and counter terrorist financing obligations contained in the MLRs. This would include, for example, requir requiring these firms to demonstrate that their controls, policies and procedures are adequate to deal with the money laundering and terrorist financing risks of the crypto asset market and requiring any officers, managers, and beneficial owners of the business to be fit and proper. And at the moment, there are only around 40 or so firms uh, registered with the FCA as registered crypto asset firms. Um, I believe it's quite a lengthy process to become registered and there's a high fail rate for applications. So hopefully that sets the scene with regards to types of crypto asset and the current regulation. I'll now pass you over to Sylvia, who will give us some insight as to why 
there is perhaps a need for greater regulation in the crypto space. Thanks, Marianne. Um, if we could just go on to the next slide, thank you. Okay, so before we delve into what the future of regulation looks like for crypto, uh, it's worth reflecting on why there are increasing calls for tightening up regulation in the sector. Lack of regulation to date has encouraged innovation and the development of new ways of exchanging money and doing business. Um, we've heard from Marianne about the different types of crypto assets, which are well beyond just cryptocurrency and the crypto sector has grown and developed at speed and regulators as can often be the way with new technology have struggled to keep pace with developments so what is driving the call for increased regulation firstly there's the increased use of crypto assets which may have started out as only being used by the more technologically literate however their use has since become more mainstream and there are there are a range of different valuations of the global crypto asset market, but different sources have estimated it at over $1 trillion, so quite a large amount, um, and we certainly know it as a growing sector. And the lack of regulation has led to the crypto sector often being seen as the wild west of digital finance. So not the best, um, not the best reputation. Um, indeed, it does have a rather tarnished reputation due to how crypto assets have been used in the past. Um, the crypto sector has had too many unfortunate associations with money laundering, cyber crime, and organized crime, um, despite that it does act, that it does have many legitimate users. So one example of this is ransomware attacks commonly using crypto assets as their ran ransom payment. Many of these ransomware attacks have also been linked to Russia. And Russia has also been accused of involvement in cyber attacks against the US, such as the large scale attack on major software company SolarWinds, which attack gave hack hackers access to organizations around the world, including the US government. And in addition, the US, in, in addition, Russia is believed to have carried out major cyber attacks against Ukraine in 2017. Cryptocurrencies have also been implicated in money laundering and fraud, such as the PLUS token Ponzi scheme, which caused investor losses of up to $2.9 billion between 2018 and 2020. There was also the well-publicized collapse of FTX Trading Limited, which at the time of its collapse, it was one of the largest digital currency exchange platforms for buying and selling cryptocurrencies. And FTX collapsed in just last year in December 22 and led to the CEO being arrested and face, now facing criminal charges, including wire fraud, money laundering and conspiracy to commit fraud. It was after FTX filed for bankruptcy and then hundreds of millions of dollars worth of tokens were transferred out of FTX. And with reports that at least $1 billion of customer funds went missing, it's no surprise that the financial services industry began to question why the company had been able to operate with such a lack of corporate controls on the sector. So it probably is unsurprising that the historic associations, the growing use of crypto assets, um, has led governments and regulators to recognise that there is a need for increased regulation of crypto as a sector. Indeed, just in May this year, the Global Markets Watchdog, the International Organisation of Securities Commissions, so that's ISCO, urged the UK to regulate crypto in the same way as traditional assets such as stocks and bonds, rather than just treating them as risky investments to be Treated, to be treated in the same way as a form of gambling. It wants them to have um, similar regulation to those traditional assets. And IOSCO is an umbrella group of regulators from 130 jurisdictions, including the UK's Financial Conduct Authority and the US's Securities and Exchange Commission. And so that, that, that um, global body made the recommendation as part of the first set of international guidelines for crypto regulation. So likely there will be more, more guidelines to follow um, and recommendations. So tighter regu future regulation of crypto assets is inevitable. However, there have also been calls for regulation not to be so strict as to choke innovation in the digital finance sector. 
So if we just go on to the next slide, please. Thanks. So turning now to one aspect of what future regulation looks like, um, a recent development we've seen is the UK regulators' proposals for dealing with crypto-related financial promotions. We have um, given an overview of financial promotions in one of our past in our past autumn series, um, so that's worth a, worth a watch if you want to get up to speed with what constitutes a regulated financial promotion. But very broadly, a uh, financial promotion is defined as a communication made by a person in the course of business, which serves to invite or induce someone to engage in investment activity. We did touch on what was anticipated for crypto assets in that autumn series, but we now have the finalised rules, so let's have a look at those new rules in more detail. So we knew that this, this, rate, um, this regulation of financial promotions was on the horizon, but it is still a fairly tight time frame between the published policy statement, which was just in June, and the new rules coming into force, um, and that's in just October, um, so very soon. It was just a four month period to, to get acquainted with them. So these new rules are consistent with the rules introduced by the FCA in 22 to tackle misleading financial promotions of high risk investments and will therefore mean that firms can only market crypto assets to UK consumers who have the appropriate knowledge and experience to invest. So the FCA's aim here is to reduce the number of consumers investing in crypto assets where those consumers have a low risk tolerance or who have characteristics of vulnerability. There is a set definition of what is a qualifying crypto asset that would come within the scope of the regime and this has been introduced into Schedule 1 to the financial promotion order. Broadly, a qualifying crypto asset is any cryptographically secured digital representation of value or contractual rights that is transferable and fungible. So noting there that this does not include crypto assets which meet the definition of electronic money or an existing controlled investment. And these qualifying crypto assets will be categorised as restricted mass market investments. So this puts them in the same category as shares in private companies or bonds issued by private limited companies. So our, as an RMMI, certain restrictions will apply on how crypto assets can be marketed to UK consumers, in addition to the overarching requirement that financial promotions must be fair, clear and not misleading. Um, so that's the, the, the usual terminology we, we see with financial promotions. So what are the restrictions when promoting crypto assets? So clear risk warnings must be included with specific wording to the effect that these types of investments are high risk investments. There must also be a cooling off period. So this will be a minimum 24 hour cooling off period for first time investors with a firm. This will mean that a consumer cannot receive a direct offer of financial promotion unless they've reconfirmed their request to proceed after waiting at least 24 hours. There will be a personalised risk warning pop-up for first-time investors. There will also be a client categorisation requirement. So meaning that before a direct offer FinProm can be made, the consumer must be categorised as a restricted, high net worth or certified sophisticated investor. So this is in line with existing client categorizations, but not all the categories available to our MMIs will be available to crypto asset promotions. Before an application or order for a crypto asset can be processed in response to a direct offer for financial promotion, the firm must also assess the specific crypto asset as appropriate for the consumer. And the final restriction worth highlighting is the proposal on banning incentives to invest. So incentives like refer a friend or new joiner bonuses are seen to unduly influence consumers' investment decisions and cause them to invest without fully considering all the risks involved. So the FCA has confirmed that the new rules will ban firms from offering any monetary or non-monetary benefits, which incentivize investment activity. Okay, um, so 
in the interest of time, I'm just going to, if we go on to the next slide, and I'll just very quickly say about the, yeah, so this, these are the promotion, the routes to promoting qualifying um, financial promotions. Um, so they're just listed on the slide there. And I'll just pick up on the fourth route um, there. The other ones are in line with what we, we would expect to see. Um, but the fourth one is that a promotion can be communicated by or on behalf of a crypto asset business registered with the FCA under the money laundering regulations. Um, so this is a development which was welcomed by those in the crypto sector as a new exemption which has been introduced for crypto businesses registered with the FCA under the money laundering regulations. So this bespoke exemption enables those businesses to communicate their own crypto asset financial promotions to UK consumers. Um, it only allows them to communicate promotions. They cannot approve promotions for others to communicate. Um, and this exemption is intended to address concerns that requiring financial promotions to be made or approved by authorised persons would significantly restrict or amount to effective ban on crypto asset promotions, given many providers are currently not authorised. Um, but it's also not worth noting that a firm authorised under only the electronic money regs or the payment services regulations is not considered an authorised person, so cannot communicate or approve their promotions. And this is set in legislation and it cannot be modified by FCA rules. Um, and if we just go on to the next slide, um, just to say before I finish up, there is a guidance consultation. Um, it's guidance on the crypto asset financial promotions, um, and that's due to close in August, um, and that will provide um, some further guidance, in, which will be published in the autumn. Um, and I am going to finish up there and now pass you over to my colleague Anna. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, if we can just go on to the next slide. Um, I'll move on to discuss the EU position regulating uh, crypto. Um, so um, I think it might just be the one before that. Sorry. Uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'll just give a quick sort of description of the EU position and then I'll go on to sort of contrast that against the proposed UK regime. So after the approval by the EU Parliament in April and then adoption by the Council of the EU in May, um, the final version of the Markets in Crypto Assets Regulation, or MICA for short, was published in June of this year. So what is MICA actually intended to do? To put simply, um, MICA is intended to establish a comprehensive, singular, independent framework um, instituting sort of a uniform EU market rules for crypto assets. So it includes key provisions for those issuing and trading crypto assets on transparency, disclosure, authorization, and supervision of transactions. And all of this is sort of with the intention to meet the four general um, and regulated objectives. So legal certainty, supportive innovation, and um, to allow for appropriate levels of consumer investor protection and market integrity, and finally, to ensure financial stability. Um, if we can go to the next slide, um, please, I'll just cover quickly the scope of MICA. So um, MICA applies to natural and legal persons and certain other undertakings who engage in issuing and offering to the public um, crypto assets or um, to engage in admission of trading of crypto assets um, or provide services relating to crypto assets in the EU. So it doesn't apply, for instance, to um, non-fungible crypto assets, uh, such as NFTs, um, and it doesn't cover crypto assets that qualify as financial instruments, deposits, funds, uh, securitization positions, or even certain pension and insurance products subject to existing financial services regulation. In terms of the assets that it does apply to, um, MICA covers three broad categories of assets. Um, so broadly, we can say that it applies to asset reference tokens, um, and this includes stable coins backed by commodities, um, e-money tokens, which uh, 
is kind of a standalone area and other tokens, so including things like utility tokens. As I said before, it doesn't generally regulate NFTs, uh, such as digital art and collectibles, just because the specific value of an NFT doesn't depend on the value of another one. So this limits the extent to which an NFT can have a financial risk and it limits the risk to the end user. Um, and if we'll just go into the next slide, um, I will go on to discuss so the future of position. So as Marianne and Sylvia have already touched upon, um, we're basically in the middle of quite large scale change in relation to crypto assets. And so the Financial Services and Markets Act 2023 received royal assent very recently at the end of June. And this will have uh, the impact of expanding the scope of the regulatory framework to include regulation of crypto assets and the promotion of crypto assets. Um, in connection with this, in February this year, um, HM Treasury opened a consultation in which it set out comprehensive proposals for the management and regulation of the UK's financial services regime for crypto assets. And this marks um, quite a major stage in the phased approach that is being undertaken in the UK. So while previously proposals had sort of focused on stable coins and financial promotions, um, this recent consultation is intended to bring crypto assets even more so into the forefront of the UK financial sector. Um, and just briefly, as I'm aware Sylvia has touched on this already, um, on the 8th of June, the UK's Financial Conduct Authority published a policy statement um, setting out the intention to introduce tough new rules for marketing crypto assets in the UK, um, which results in potential criminal liability. So I think from this, we can take the view that it's very much the intention to establish a robust, comprehensive approach to crypto in the UK. And Finally, if we move on to the next slide, I'll touch upon a few points um, that uh, we can sort of contrast and see similarities and differences between the EU and UK regimes. So although we don't have the final version of the 2023 Act yet, um, we can anticipate it will be wide ranging, wide ranging and sort of in conjunction with our understanding of the approach intended by the relevant regulators, we can draw some pretty helpful illustrative comparisons with MICA. So a pretty major difference um, between the two regimes would be the approach that's been taken. So whilst MICA established a new uniform legislative framework, the UK is choosing to expand the existing framework instead to encompass a broader range of digital assets. As opposed to creating a standalone regime, the UK framework will be created through amendments to existing legislation, regulations, and of course, the FCA handbook, amongst other things. The second point that I've touched upon in the slide is that um, MICA, uh, the scope of MICA will relate to um, the issuing and offering of crypto assets to the public, um, whereas under the HM proposals, the mere issuing of a crypto asset is, in, is not in itself a regulated activity, except for limited sort of exceptions, for instance, where the crypto asset is a feedback stablecoin. However, it should be noted that the UK does intend to regulate the admittance of crypto asset to trading on a crypto asset trading venue, and it also intends to regulate public offers of crypto assets that are not security tokens. So that is more in line with the approach taken under MICA. As Marianne mentioned, there is increasing consensus on the definition of crypto asset, with the definition under both the UK and EU regimes being very similar. Um, but the one difference here is that under um, the UK proposals, there will be spe less specifically detailed exemptions. So this is possible because the UK's existing regime already contains a pretty broad variety of exemptions and negative scope guidance, which negates the need to incorporate specific exemptions. The final two points, which I'll hopefully fly through quite quickly as I know we're short on time, is um, the treatment of NFTs, which will be different. So NFTs will not fall under the scope of MICA, um, obviously with some small exceptions, but in the UK framework, um, it may pull certain activities performed in relation to NFTs into the scope. It's probably pretty important to note on that, though, that NFTs are not going to be brought into the scope of the extension of financial promotion treaty. And Finally, um, a similarity between the two in terms of location requirements. So MICA authorised providers will need to have a registered office in a member state um, where they undertake at least part of their business in providing crypto asset services. And similarly, 
the HMP proposals anticipate there to be a requirement that in order to be authorised under the UK regime, operators of crypto asset trading venues will have to have a UK based entity. entity. Um, so that was quite a fly through comparison, um, but we hope that this has been informative and interesting and thank you all for attending this morning. Um, we do have our final session of our summer series next week on the Economic Crime Plan 2.0, so please do feel welcome to attend.